what happened in Catalonia the last few weeks are quite rocking, not only Spain, but also European Union. And here at the Institute, we are doing quite a lot of research on democracy for the 21st century. And we discuss very much exactly this question about secession. So I'm very, very happy to have a number of people here to talk about this. Professor José Luis Martí from uh, Pompeo Fabra in, in Catalonia. And you, perhaps you are Catalonian too, we can discuss that later. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have uh, Niklas Brienberg from the Utrikspolitiska Institutet. And we also have Katarina Bandt, who is here from the Institute for Future Studies. But all of this is going to be moderated by Julia Mosquera from the Institute for Future Studies. So I give the floor to you. Thank you, Gustav. It's a pleasure to be holding a seminar on this topic and having such great people speaking about it. So I'm just going to very quickly introduce the people we're going to have today. So it's a pleasure to have Jose Luis Martí flying from Barcelona. He's an uh, associate professor of philosophy of law at the University Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. Uh, professor Martí worked among other things on issues concerning democracy, recent political movements in Spain, and his research focuses as well on global democracy, constitutional philosophy, philosophy of international law. And he has published a number of papers on these topics, but as well, quite famous uh, co-author book with Philippe Dit, uh, titled Political Philosophy in Public Life, Civil Republicanism in Zapateros, Spain, uh, published by Princeton University Press in 2010. Uh, Niklas Brienberg, uh, he is a research fellow at the Swedish Institute for International uh, Affairs in Stockholm. And his work uh, is among other things on regional security practices, security communities and EU foreign and security policy. And he has a special focus on Mediterranean affairs, right? So uh, he has published a number of papers on these issues and recently published a book on diplomacy and security community building, EU and crisis management in the Western Mediterranean, published by Bradley. And then we have Katerina uh, Ben Rasmussen, who is a postdoc at the Institute for Future Studies here um, in our house. Uh, Katerina defended her dissertation on the topic of democracy and the common good. And her research topics are, among other things, she works on a lot of different topics, but among other things, she works on discrimination, sexism, racism, and she also works on a project on harm and discrimination. So, Jose Luis, your turn now, um, and then we're going to have some time for questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, thank you, Gustav, for organizing this. I think it's a terrific occasion, actually, to discuss about this hot issue in Barcelona and in, in Catalonia right now. And thank you, Julia, for the organization also of the event. And thank you all for coming. Um, I, it's a pleasure, actually, to be here. It's not my first time in Stockholm. Um, it's always a pleasure to come back. Um, I think it's not so much a pleasure to come to talk about this because, as you can imagine, it's very hard times in, in Catalonia. And, I mean, in a way, it's, I, I feel you know, uh, glad that this issue attracts the interest of many people like you. Um, I hope uh, this could happen in many other places in Europe. Um, and I think, as I will try to, to say later, I think that one of the problems that we feel right now is um, that we don't see the international community sufficiently involved. Of course, this is a internal conflict in some sense of internal, right? If there is internal conflicts anymore in, in the world, but, um, but we would like actually to have some help from abroad. We can discuss this later, um, but um, I think we have proven not to be able actually to find a reasonable solution so far. So maybe it would be um, uh, excellent to have some help uh, from other countries. So I will basically make a, a brief uh, talk, uh, 20 minutes long, more or less. Uh, and I will divide my comments in four points. Um, I was asked to give some kind of historical introduction, right? I will not spend much time on the history, but I, I think it's, it's important actually to have some uh, big picture here and, and to know where we come from, um, actually to have the context. Then I will give you s a few data about the social situation in Catalonia and how Catalans are divided about this issue. I will give you some, some numbers here about uh, what Catalans mostly want and things like this. Um, then I will focus on the legality and the legitimacy of some of the most recent moves that we have seen from both governments. And I, th I have serious doubts, actually, about the legality and legitimacy of, of some of these moves. And I think this gets uh, the conflict even more complicated. I think 
the two governments are going in the wrong direction, um, at the very least because they are making these moves that are illegal and, and illegitimate. And I think they are also being strategically mistaken. I think they are making a lot of mistakes at the strategic level. I will try to, to give you some arguments about this. And then I will finish, if I have time, I will finish with a, a proposal of how I think that we should think about this issue, at least in the long run. It's not that I'm very optimistic, actually, about my proposal in the short run. I think the situation, I don't find, actually, any way out uh, in the short run for the problem. But at least in the long run, I think I have you know, some views about how it should be uh, solved. And I think they are quite representative of how many Catalans think about this issue. OK, let me go for the historical introduction. So the first thing I have to say is that the conflict is not new, right? So the conflict is at least 300 years old, and or at least this is what the secessionists claim, right? So they think that Catalonia, all of this is controversial, but it doesn't matter. So the important thing is that nationalists, or at least the Catalan secessionists, they think that this conflict comes from 1714. In 1714, Catalonia participated in a war of succession, not a war of secession, but a war of succession of the king, right? And they sided the wrong king, let, let's say, uh, and they lost, right? They lost the war, and the, um, those who gave support to the Bourbons, right, who won uh, that war, uh, they conquered Catalonia or so. That's the perception that some Catalans have. And from that time on, it, what is true is that the Catalan uh, self-government that, that there used to be for a long time, and it was a medieval thing, so it was a very old thing, the Catalan self-government was uh, erased, was uh, suppressed by the Bourbons. And then the Bourbons had their own project of unifying Spain and having a centralized kingdom and so on. Um, so I will not spend more time on this, except if you want to make any question later. But I think it's important to start saying this is not a new thing, right? So this is a very old thing. Some Catalans, at least, they perceive that this is rooted in a very old conflict. And they are making, all the time, they are making comparisons with what happened in 1714, what happened during the Civil War in the 20th century, what happened during the Franco regime, right? So the, the history is very present in the conflict. Of course, it's, as I just mentioned, it's one of the aspects of history that is present is precisely what happened during the Franco regime. So Franco, well, first of all, during the Civil War, right? In the Civil War, Catalans, uh, some Catalans were with Franco and some Catalans were with the Republic, as you can imagine. Um, many people say that, for instance, uh, a typical situation could be one in which a priest or uh, a nun, right, who were Catholics, for being Catholics, they had they were inclined to be with to side Franco because of the uh, some extreme actions that the Republic had done against the Church and, and so on. Um, so, qua Catholics, they were supposed to be Francoists, right? But maybe they were politically, you know, in favor of Repub the Republic and democracy and so on. So, at some point in the war, there were situations in which these priests and nuns w they were pursuit, right, and, and fight for both sides, from both sides in the war, right? And so they were a double victim, right, in the war. So it's true that the situation in Catalonia in the Civil War was a little bit ambiguous. Um, and you could perceive this especially during the Franco dictatorship. So Franco prohibited Catalan in the use of, uh, in the official language, not at home, but in the official language, it was prohibited. Um, he had a very clear plan to uh, establish Spanish as the language, the official language, all over the territory, including Catalonia. And of course, many Catalans still remember, because this happened just 50 years ago, they still remember what happened, and they feel a, a feeling of oppression and domination coming from what they call the Spaniards, and of course, a lot of stereotypes are going on right there. Uh, but the thing is, this is still a vivid memory, right, in Catalonia. Um, after uh, Franco, after the dictatorship, during the democrat the transition to democracy, nationalist governments won, right, uh, for several years in Catalonia, and they had their own plan actually to create a an, an kind of nation building in Catalonia, um, but of course nation, uh, understanding nation by the Catalan nation, right, so they, they wanted to uh, educate the new generations uh, knowing the history of Catalonia or their reading of the history of Catalonia, learning Catalan and developing Catalan symbols and, and other signs of the Catalan nation. And this was very successful, so we have had for uh, more than two decades now 
a quite consistent and well-defined plan actually to establish some kind of Catalan nation building. And what we are uh, watching these days is actually the result of this plan, right? Um, there is, maybe you've read, part of the controversy these days is that the Spanish government, they announced they want to intervene in the Catalan school. And that is a, a very controversial issue in Catalonia because Catalans are very proud of their uh, school system. They don't want the Spaniards to intervene at all in the school system. But part of the reason is that they are aware that they have been using the schools to promote this kind of political idea of Catalonia. You, m you might think this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not making a judgment here, but what I can tell you, I've been educated in this school, what I can tell you is I don't think this school is very different from any other school in any other country. So the Spanish schools are doing mostly, more or less the same thing with the Spanish nation building. I think most uh, school systems in the world, or at least those that I know, and I know a few of them, most of them basically do similar things, right? So it's not that the Catalan school is fascist or they are trying to indoctrinate people. So it's, it's simply that they have this kind of perspective. They study the history of Catalonia, they study Catalan, they invest a lot of time in the study Catalan. And it's true, they have this kind of, you know, political idea of what ca the Catalan nation is and so on and so forth. But this is not very different to what you can find probably, in, I don't know the system here, but probably in the school system in Swedish, in Sweden. Uh, and certainly that's what you have in if you go to the Spanish school system. So more recently what happened, uh, and, and I will go quickly here because I know, I think most of you will be aware of, of the most recent history. What happened is that in 2010, um, uh, actually a little bit earlier, in 2006, the Catalans uh, passed a new Catalan constitution. We call it statute, right? They passed a new constitution that was, uh, accepted, uh, adopted in a referendum, in a popular referendum in Catalonia, which basically the most important uh, content of that constitution was that it uh, involved a greater devolution of power. So it was perceived as the maximum kind of self-government that Catalonia could have in the constitutional system. Um, so we passed this constitution, the constitution according to the constitution, the Spanish constitution, the Catalan constitution was approved by the Spanish parliament as well, after the referendum in Catalonia. And then finally, in the very last step, the Spanish constitutional court uh, struck down a few articles of the constitution saying that they were unconstitutional, right? I will avoid now the technical details. We can come back if you want uh, during the Q&A. Um, my personal opinion is that some of them probably looked like unconstitutional, but that's not the, the issue. The issue is that most Catalans perceived that that was like a threat, like an imposition coming from this Spanish constitutional court. It was evident to everyone that this constitutional court was politicized, right? So you could count the conservative majority in the court. They were replaced, actually, according to their ideas. They were asked to uh, give support to the government's, uh, the central government's uh, view. Uh, everyone knew that that was a political decision. And then Catalans perceived it as a threat or as an imposition, a unilateral imposition. And again, this amount, uh, that's why the history is important. This comes to a history or at least a memory of a history of domination and oppression, right? What they thought, some Catalans thought, okay, that's a new uh, instance of this historical oppression that we've suffered from Spain for centuries, right? And for many people, that was enough, right? They said, enough is enough. We cannot stand this anymore. We want it. Uh, a, con a Catalan constitution that was compatible with the Spanish constitution, but then we are said that we are not able to make our own decisions about our constitution and we don't want to continue in that situation. So many people, if you ask any Catalan nowadays, uh, probably they will tell you that the current situation is a result of what happened in 2010 when the constitutional court uh, limited the Catalan constitution. Um, since then, what you have probably seen on TV is that the Catalan secessionist movement has been growing and growing. Uh, one significant feature of this movement is that it's quite or maybe absolutely peaceful. I mean, nothing is absolutely peaceful, but, but it's quite peaceful and civic, right? So you probably have seen the images of these demonstrations. They are massive demonstrations in Barcelona with very little violence or not violence at all, right? Um, they are very well organized. They have very good civil associations uh, organizing all these demonstrations and mobilizations. Um, they can keep control of the people and they can, you know, quite effectively tell them what to do and what not to do. 
um, and they have been demonstrating year after year for six years now, at least, at the very least, since 2011, right? So we are now in the sixth or seventh year in this his recent history. And what happens is that they have been trying, that's, or at least that's what they say, they've been trying once and again to have a legal referendum, to have some legal voting here about their future. They captured this idea with the idea of the right to the site. That's what they say, the right to the site. We have the right to the site, our future, and to make a decision about what we want to do, what we want to live with, right? And whether we want to live with Spain anymore or not. Um, so they um, reconstruct it as a right to the site. And what they say is we've been trying hard, very hard, to have a legal agreement with the Spanish government. But it never came, right? So the Spanish government has been blocking systematically any aspiration of having this referendum or having this voting in Catalonia, or at least having an agreement. At the very beginning, after this uh, judicial decision by the Constitutional Court that I just referred, at the very beginning, the Catalan vindication, the Catalan claim, was not to have independence. The very first reaction they had was to have some kind of constitutional reform with basically a fiscal and cultural compact. That's what they called it, right? So to have some fiscal agreement, which is one of the hot issues, but also to have some kind of culture, cultural protection of Catalan and Catalan culture and so on. Um, and they were, most of them at least, were very happy to have just a, a constitutional reform, right, that settled these issues. But the thing is, of course, the response they found was no, and then uh, they turned into uh, secessionism or independentism um, more and more. Um, <coughs> I will say very little about the most recent events. You all have clear images in, in mind now about October the 1st, for instance, when Catalans tried to have this kind of referendum. Let me just say that I think it's obvious, I think independentists would admit this referendum was illegal, right? It was unconstitutional. Uh, they never meant it to be legal. Actually, what they say is this is just the reaction uh, for not having been able to agree a referendum, a legal referendum with the Spanish government. So we finally decided to go our way and, and make it anyway. But they, of course, are aware that it was illegal. Um, at least it was illegal according to the Spanish legislation, because what they did is they passed some specific legislation that regulated this referendum uh, in early September. And of course, this, this legislation in, passed in September is plainly unconstitutional. Actually, these, these legislation, these are two acts that they approved the Spanish, uh, sorry, the Catalan Parliament passed in early September. These two acts are actually, uh, they create a separate legal regime in Catalonia, which is plainly unconstitutional for Spanish standards. Um, so they went for this referendum and, um, five minutes? Almost, okay. So it means less than five minutes. <laughs> A little bit more, okay. <laughs> so they went, uh, they, they went for this referendum, and you all remember what happened. So the police, the Spanish police, uh, was very harsh. They uh, uh, repressed the people who tried to vote, and you all saw the images uh, on TV. Now the Spanish Minister of International Affairs is denying that this uh, event happened, and he says that this is fake news, but I can tell you that it was real. And even non-secessionists, as myself, I'm not a secessionist, um, we were there and we felt very, very sorry and very angry about what happened and we actually uh, uh, got down to the streets on the afternoon to march and protest about what, what was going on. So let me give you a few data about the situation now, now in Barcelona, especially the social and political situation. Um, so the first thing we have to know is that not all Catalans are independentists. Right, so maybe I don't know if that is salient internationally, but that's very important. Catalans are divided about this. Actually, it's very difficult to know how much, how many Catalans are secessionists, be, pr partly because we haven't had a referendum, right? So that's why we want a. Ref I want a referendum to begin with to count how many Catalans are in favor of independence. But according to the results of the last elections we had in Catalonia in 2015. These were very special elections. They were called by the secessionists themselves. They were called plebiscitary elections, meaning that basically there was one single issue, independence, yes or no. And then, so those parties that were pro-independence, they were very clear, right, in showing their allegiance to the uh, uh, pro-independence side. 
So you could count, it's a proxy to know how many independentists there are in Catalonia, at least of among those who voted. Of course, not everyone voted, and that's one of the problems, but, but at least we have some, you know, objective data here. And what happened on, in those elections is that independentists were about 48% of the votes, right? According to the Catalan law, they finally got an over-representation in the parliament, in the Catalan parliament, so they have the majority of seats in the parliament, but they only uh, got 48% of the votes. According to the polls, if you uh, check the polls, even the most recent ones, um, the support for independence goes usually from 35 to 50%. It never goes beyond 50%. And in the very last poll that I could check last night, uh, the support for independence was 39%. So it's not a majoritarian feeling, but it's very mobilized, it's very active, and it's very salient in the media and so on, and, and politically speaking, and in, in the institutions and the life in Barcelona. It's very interesting to see what's the main divide between Catalans. Uh, sociologically speaking, and basically the debate, I think, is cultural and linguistic, right? So if you go in Catalonia, the lang most people are bilingual, so most people are able to speak uh, Spanish and Catalan, but people have one primary language normally, and if you look at those whose, whose primary language is Spanish, 75% of them are against independence, right? But if you turn to see what happens with those whose primary language is Catalan, then 80% of them are in favor of independence. So basically it's a cultural division, right? So people whose primary language is Catalan normally are in favor of independence. And this idea that their primary language is Catalan means that most of them, or all of them, basically are born in Catalonia, have their parents being born in Catalonia, they have ancestors, right? All the family being born in Catalonia. While the others are basically immigrants who came to Barcelona in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, or the descendants of those immigrants whose primary language is a Spanish. That's n that doesn't explain all the cases, but it's, it's quite um, relevant, quite significant of the variation. <coughs> then there's another divide between metropolitan area of Barcelona and the rest of Catalonia. Part of this divide might have to do with, how much? Three, Three okay. Has might have to do with the cultural divide because most of these immigrants and descendants of immigrants actually live in the metropolitan area. So part of it is tracking the other divide, but there's more than this, right? So there's this is a cultural divide also between the urban and the rural areas and so on, so on and so forth. There is some social class division, normally wealthier people, and, and also some education level division, the, those with higher education levels. The wealthier and those with higher education levels tend to be in favor of independence, but this is just a slight divide. So the most important one is cultural and, and linguistic. And needless to say, uh, the situation right now is very difficult socially and politically, right? So we used to live in harmony, quite, I mean, qu quite a good harmony for, for a long time, but in the most recent years, the social life has been uh, getting worse and worse, right? So now it's more tense than ever, right? So people are very divided about this issue. After six years of active mobilization, everyone knows what they want to know about this issue, right? We could say that people are quite well informed, right? Um, I mean, they've been discussing this once after another time every day, right? With the, the neighbors, with the parents in the schools, etc. So they, they, all citizens have quite a firm and quite considered understanding or judgment about this issue. And the thing is, all these percentages don't move, right? In the, l in the last years, even despite all the recent events, they don't move, right? So are very steady. So let me finish in, in this final couple of minutes by making a ref quick reference to um, what I see as a, an illegality and illegitimacy of the recent moves. So I think, so it's, it's obvious, I will not spend much time saying that what the Catalan government is doing is illegal. Actually, they claim it to be illegal according to the Spanish legality. What they claim is that they have created a new Catalan legality, which is, of course, independent from the Spanish one. So in a way, they are presupposing that they are already independent, right? Uh, at least from the legal point of view. Um, so it's not surprising to anyone if I say that they are making these illegal moves. But maybe it's more controversial to say what, that the Spa what the Spanish government is doing is also illegal. But many people say it's illegal, right? So the police aggressions last October the 1st, the detentions of the two big leaders of these civil associations last week, 
uh, or the Article 155 that you probably have heard about that was announced by the Spanish Prime Minister last Saturday and it will be approved, everyone expects it to be approved by the Senate on Friday. Many people think that this is widely disproportional, right? that violates the Spanish law and the Spanish constitution because the Spanish constitution requires all these measures to be proportional and they think that they are not being proportional to the kind of damage that they are supposed to prevent. So many people have doubts about the legality of the Spanish government moves. Maybe that's not you know, a very new thing, but it's one issue that I think it's relevant in the discussion. But the most important thing from, from my point of view is that many of these moves are also illegitimate, right? On the Catalan side, I think that much of what they are doing, the Catalan government and the session, secessionist movement is doing, is illegitimate because they don't even have the support of the majority of Catalans, right? Even if they had it, I don't think that you can make a revolution just with 51% of popular support, right? I'm not saying I'm not a majoritarianist uh, of this kind, right? I'm not saying if you have 51%, then it's okay, but they don't even have this 51%. I think that uh, and I think many people, many political philosophers would, would say that uh, when you are trying to break up with uh, established democracy like the Spanish one, which is minimally legitimate, right? It's, it's democratic and legitimate according to some, any international standards. If you want to break up with that kind of legality, you can do it if you have good motive, good reasons, but you need a wide popular support. And this is, of course, missing in Catalonia. So I think I have serious doubts about the democratic legitimacy of what President Puigdemont and the secessionists are doing in Catalonia right now. But I also have doubts about what the Spanish government is doing, right? So he's not, okay, I finish. He's not making um, any consultation to the Spanish people. Actually, the Spanish people, is their views are evolving very quickly and it would be very interesting to see what they have to say about it. The polls are very interesting at this point. They reflect uh, a shift right, towards more open views, uh, willing actually to consider the possibility of having a referendum, which I advance, it's my suggestion, my proposal for the future. So I think that it would be interesting actually to know what the Spanish people have to say about it, but the Spanish government is not even consulting them, not calling for elections, not having any kind of interaction with the Spanish electorate, and it's just following one possible strategy. So I, I don't have more time. Let me just finish by saying that, um, as I just announced, my proposal, m I think in the long run at least, the only solution for this um, uh, conflict will be to have a legal referendum in Catalonia. I don't find any reason not to have it, right? Philosophical or pragmatic. I don't, don't see it, especially considering where we are right now. The conflict is very, very difficult. We don't see any other way out. And I think uh, as we were saying last night over dinner, uh, many people in Catalonia are saying these days, I'm just repeating what I hear constantly in Catalonia, the only good news here is that a war is impossible, but a war is impossible because Catalans don't have guns. That's what uh, you can hear every day, right? That is not very, <laughs> um, you know, a, a very... Um, Reassuring, thank you. Reassuring thought, right? So, and and I think the conflict is uh, uh, the most, the strongest conflict I've ever seen, for sure. I never thought that I was going to see anything like that happening in Barcelona, where we had uh, quite a, as you probably know, quite a good life uh, uh, so far. And so, it's very difficult actually to find a solution if the actors involved are telling you that the only reason why there is no war nowadays going on in Barcelona is that one side has no, no guns, right? So thank you and we can... <laughs>
Barcelona, mm -hmm. and they have moved either to Madrid or Canary Islands, Andalusia, mm -hmm. other places. And within the last week, it's been 634. So what are the reasons, in your opinion, you that are there, we are here, the reasons that is still keep upholding the movement at this point mm -hmm. when we are seeing, they are seeing that it's not an economic reason anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's the first question. And then the second question is, it's funny, it's interesting when we read on the news, we hear um, all the time listening to the radio, let's say it, whatever, uh, that from both sides they have been appealing to the notion of democracy. So the central government has prohibited the referendum on the basis that it's not democratic. And then you hear the other side of the movement, the Catalan government saying that the implementation of the 155 article is anti-democratic as well. Mm -hmm. And then I was listening to the radio this morning and then the, ci the civilians, the people are saying, we live with an anti-democratic government and our politicians, all of them, no matter which side, they are all anti-democratic. So what's going on? How many notions of democracy uh, <laughs> are going on at the same time within mm -hmm. Spanish politics? And I assume it's the same uh, probably in many other places in Europe. So two very brief questions. Mm -hmm. Not Well, the questions are brief. <laughs> the questions are brief, but the responses are... Uh, okay, so let me, um, in response to the first one, uh, it's not only that it's 1,300, I think that that's the last figure I saw, companies that are leaving Barcelona, because these might tell you something or not. Uh, the thing is, you should know that most of them are big companies, right? In, in Catalonia, there used to be uh, 250,000 companies, so 1,300 is not that much if you compare it that way. That's what the Catalan Minister of Economy said yeah. last night. Uh, but of course, the, the relevant thing is that they are the, the biggest companies, right? So, in a, and among the 5,000 biggest companies in Catalonia, 1,300 have left Catalonia. The headquarters have been moved to a different uh, location, which means that 20% of them, the biggest companies, and 30% of the Catalan economy has moved headquarters uh, to a different location. So that's very worrisome. Um, but in response to your question, I think that uh, for, a for a lot of people, for most secessionists, I would say right now, it's not uh, an economic issue anymore, right? Maybe the economic issues were relevant at the beginning. As I told you in 2010, the first reaction by Catalans was to say, okay, let's have a, an agreement with the Spaniards about a fiscal compact. We will be able to, uh, from this moment on to collect our own taxes and we will have some economic autonomy. That was the issue in 2001 of the central issues in 2010. But that's not the main issue anymore, I think. And now they perceive it as a threat and a fight for their cultural uh, survivals. Actually, they, they think that they are in, endangered, right, by the Catalan uh, oppression, as they call it. A and they think that if they don't defend themselves quite firmly at this moment, uh, the Catalan na nation and the Catalan culture is, is in danger, right? So I don't think the, the economic issues are so relevant. And I don't think that many people would actually say that they have reasons for being independentist. Many people just admit that it's an emotional thing. And I think at this, at this point, I think that's okay. I think, I mean, the reasons or motivations that people may have to vote one thing or another in a democracy, um, you know, you don't want actually to say that people have, you know, good or bad motivations or attitudes. I mean, I, I'm really ready to accept that many people may have emotional attitudes regarding certain issues and that are, th these act attitudes are in principle, they are okay. Um, so I think if they, if they, what they say, if that, even if they don't have any reason, objective reason, they just want to have their own country separated from Spain. For me, that's okay. The relevant thing, of course, connect, connecting with your second question, the relevant thing is whether there is a majority of Catalans wanting that. I think there is not at this point. And, and I think that, for me, that's the main worry, right? So you're right. Many people, uh, all the actors involved, they claim to be, you know, in the side of democracy here. Um, and of course, there are many understandings, possible understandings of democracy, but something that makes me think that they are being just hypocritical, most of them, not all of them maybe, but, but most of them are being hypocritical, is that um, the secessionists, they've been claiming once and again that they want to have a referendum, right? Because they think it's the people who has to make a decision here, not the politicians, not Madrid. Uh, it's the people, the Catalan people. They have the right to decide. But the thing is, in the last elections, what we saw is that o they only gathered 48 percent of the votes. So the democratic conclusion from that election was that you know the majority of voters, not of Catalans, because actually, if you 
uh, compared with Catalans, the percentage is even lower, right? The majority of voters in those elections uh, voted against independence, so they should have said, you know, okay, that's the end of the story, or at least for a while, right? So we, we give up this idea. But they didn't do it, right? I think that, for me, that's a symptom, a sign that they are being hypocritical. And the same in the other side. So many people in, in Madrid, or in those who give support to the ca uh, Spanish government, what they say is, Catalans cannot decide these issues on their own, because these are constitutional issues. They want to make a constitutional revolution in Spain, and if that is the case, then we have to consult all the Spaniards, right? The, the national demos is the Spanish one, not the Catalan one. They cannot impose any solution to the rest of the Spanish people. But the thing is, they don't call for a referendum either, right? So I don't think that um, they are actually um, really committed to an idea of democracy, or at least the idea of democracy that I would defend. <laughs> Uh, but what I would like to focus on is basically the, uh, the international context. You hear me? Yeah. The, interna the international context and specifically the European, the European context to this, to this particular crisis. Um, I am a political scientist and by training. And I uh, have been trained in international relations and kind of the intersection between international relations and European integration. So this is basically where I'm where I come, coming from. I'd like to end. Uh, my intervention here on highlighting what I think is an inherent tension in all liberal democracies between notions of popular sovereignty expressed through uh, representations or expressed in other means of or basically a political preference formation and uh, rule of law basically the idea that politicians can do whatever they like basically there are there are basically rules and procedures to be followed that tension is, is always going to be present in, in in liberal democracies and in and, and when things are good it's a productive tension when things are bad, we, we enter uh, a situation where I think we've witnessed now in, in, in Spain and Catalonia. So firstly, I'd uh, like to make a, a reflection, basically, on the theme of secession in international politics. Secession, if you look at the history from 1945 onwards, is a very rare phenomenon. It's, a very, it's very seldom that territories from well, it's, well it's, it's a rare phenomenon in advanced established uh, democracies in the West, basically. If you look from history of 1945 onwards, secession is a, a very rare phenomenon. It doesn't really happen. There are very few cases. Uh, of course, if you look in, 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 in a broad international perspective, secession as a consequence of conflicts or uh, decolonialization, yes, it does happen, definitely. But in the case that we're talking about now, in terms of um, an established democracy, it's, it's very seldom, basically. There are very few cases. Quebec almost got it. You remember the referendum in 1995? And we saw uh, uh, something that could have led to some, uh, su such a um, situation in 2014 with Scotland, the Scottish referendum. But there are trends that are interesting to look at. Even though secession is not perhaps an, an, an a very common phenomenon, decentralization is very uh, common in, in Western countries, in Western uh, democracies. This is taken from a study, a vast study made by political scientists now um, active at Chapel Hill in, in the US. It's Lisbeth Hooge and Gary Marks and their team of researchers that had developed a regional autonomy index. They cover, I think, 81 countries from 1950 and up until 2010. And they tried to measure the kind of the, this process of decentralization in, uh, in uh, Western parts of, of the world and also beyond the West, basically. And they tried to get at dimensions of regional autonomy. They look at institutional depth of, of how far decentralization goes, policy scopes, what kind of questions are actually kind of referred from central level to, to uh, other levels of, of governance, regional or local levels. Fiscal autonomy, uh, the fiscal compact that, that Jose Luis was, was referring to in the Catalan case as one of these kind of bone of contestation, obviously. Borrow autonomy, can, can regional um, uh, units or, or, or other units kind of uh, borrow money from, from international markets? Can they, can they uh, collect public debt, basically? And what kind of political representation do, do we see? 
Now, this is a table that is centered on, on self-rule in, in Spain, basically. But it's just to give you this idea that, from, again, from political science research, the um, focus on the process of decentralization has been uh, in, in the focus uh, for us for, for, for a long time. And, of course, compared to many other regions in other countries, in, in other places of the world, what the Spanish uh, uh, um, autonomous regions have in terms of self-rule is, is big, of course. They have a lot of, of, of autonomy compared to many other uh, regional units in other uh, comparable countries in, in, in the world. Now, of course, you can imagine if it's the right level, if it's done, uh, and if it's in, uh, in, in, in kind of on the level of what people want and stuff like that, that's obviously uh, perfectly uh, fine to discuss. But just give you an, an idea that this, uh, in, in terms of, of an international comparison, what uh, Spanish regions have is, 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 is a high level of autonomy. Now, there were two um, ideas, I think, uh, prevalent in, in this strand of research in political science, uh, if you go back perhaps 20 years or so. So um, in the late 1990s, you, will, you would hear uh, researchers like Michael Keating and others would say that, look, decentralization will have uh, political effects. We think, there are reasons to believe here that parties, movements in uh, non-sovereign regions in uh, various countries, these political parties, these movements will move from a position where they try to seek more autonomy or even independence for their non-sovereign regions to become much more of normal political actors due to the effect of decentralization. When political power are transferred to regional levels, these actors will have to not only think about independence, but think about, you know, ordinary uh, uh, policy issues, healthcare, how do we fix our cities now that we are actually capable of deciding on stuff that we couldn't decide before, now we have to kind of go into the, the ordinary politics, day-to-day -day politics. <laughs> and independence might actually lose out in terms of the appeal, the claims for it. That was one idea that was very prevalent a couple of years ago. And, and another idea that was particular to uh, this research as focused on the European U Union was that European integration would increase this tendency. So remember that European integration, the EU, has provided member states, regions within member states, with uh, polit means of political influence. There are the Committee of Regions in, in, in the EU. There are numbers of um, um, economic uh, resources that are channeled through uh, the EU budget to regions, basically. You have the structural fund, you have the cohesion funds and stuff. So the idea was here that the European integration would actually enhance this, um, this trend of, of kind of perhaps lessening the appeal of independence for regions. Now that has not happened. And I think there is, and that, again, from a researcher's perspective, this is very uh, curious. I mean, there were, we, we thought, strong arguments to believe that we were supposed to see one kind of, of development, but that didn't happen. So why? There is some kind of a puzzle here. There's a research puzzle. I think one interesting, uh, and now we're, I'm more kind of speculating. I'm not sure that everyone agrees with me here, but at least to me, one important lesson, I think, for um, regional actors in, in places like Catalonia and perhaps Scotland, Basque countries and other places. Regions within member states that we had a strong sentiment that were perhaps in favor of, of uh, enhanced self-rule or, or, or even independence. The political lesson from European integration was that those promises made perhaps in the 80s and 90s was not really fulfilled. Member states, EU member states, have been particularly well at protecting their sovereignty in EU bodies, in a sense. So in the sense that, that you could, as a region, influence, make very meaningful influence on policy making in the EU, that has not really been fulfilled. Council of Ministers, uh, uh, of course, is one key uh, body of, of decision making in the EU. And there, of course, only national governments are, are present. Certainly, the national government has been good at kind of uh, how do you say, get regional um, uh, authorities to influence their decision making in the Council of Ministers, but that is very much up to, to the member states. And I think in the case of, of what we see now in, in Spain, 
it has not been fulfilled in the terms of those high hopes that we've seen from, from Catalonia, for instance, in the 80s and the 90s, that the EU would provide a new platform for, for political influence. That has not happened. And I remember I, I'm involved with a, a research project with a colleague in, at Liverpool University, Richard Gillespie, that has, he has studied um, the evolution of, of, of nationalist or pro-sovereignty parties in, in Catalonia and, and, and the Basque Country for a long time. And he always comes back to one of those kind of uh, critical moments when uh, perhaps preferences and lessons were being taught by um, Catalans and Basques. There was, uh, if you remember, the uh, um, event uh, around the European Convention that was supposed to lead to European Constitution, early 2000s. Um, around that time, there was consultations, broad consultations going on in, in, in broader section um, of, of, of political um, authorities and actors in Europe in order to basically um, have a um, period of reflection on what kind of European constitution could for the EU should be made, basically. It was after the Nice Treaty, a lot of people, a lot of actors were very unhappy with uh, uh, treaty reforms in the EU uh, at that time, and the idea was that you should have something else in order to uh, move the, the idea of treaty reforms forward in, in the EU. So that was the time of the European Convention. Now, when Catalan parties, Basque parties, were raising issues such as what Jose Luis has been talking about, cultural autonomy, cultural issues, uh, the statue of language, minority language in the EU, they were basically not heard. So I think a lot of the kind of the political lessons that were being, being taught by these actors in the early 2000s reinforced that notion that, hey, if you want to have real political influence in the EU, you should actually go, you, you need to become a member state your own, basically. And that is one of the, I think, one of the paradoxical effects, perhaps, of, of European integration. The EU that was supposed to lessen these kind of territorial conflict, to some extent, you might argue that it has provided, perhaps, a, a, a new bone of contentation, or, or at least expectations were created that was not fulfilled. And that's, when you're talking about emotion, like José Luis was doing, that's a complicated thing, of course. Um, so that, uh, I think that was, was one of the things, that, that decentralization did not really uh, provide the, the, um, uh, the effects that we thought it might uh, a couple of uh, decades ago. Um, there is, um, and I think in, in, in parallel to that question has been the question that has been debated very much in the sense of a kind of a, you know, a scholarly uh, debate on the issue that if Catalonia were to be an independent state, would it have to reapply? Would it be uh, excluded from the European Union? And would it have to, for, to reapply for, for membership? Now, the standard answer here is yes. Any new state that is formed w uh, from current member states would have to um, mm, exit the EU and then reapply for membership again. That is basically the standard answered and we have seen this going back to uh, Romano Prodi as head of the European Commission and that line has been been followed by Barroso and now basically also by Juncker. So that is basically an, 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 an idea that has been, been, been out there for a long time. I'm just going to say that again coming from, from an international or an kind of an EU um, studies perspective that pers that position can be perhaps questioned a bit. I'm not saying. I mean, I'm not saying that these are kind of crystal clear arguments that I'm going to make here. But I just want to challenge that position a little bit. If we and I'm going to do it basically on three um, grounds, as you see here. If we take the notion that EU law and European integration constitute a legal order in Europe that goes beyond standard international law, that there is something more, there's something uh, greater to the European legal order than traditional international law, there seems to be that the standard legal interpretation of secession isn't really uh, valid, or it at least can be questioned. And this is more of a kind of a, uh, uh, an argument that goes against kind of political leaders in the EU. If you say that the European legal order is something more than international law, then um, there seems 
it seems to follow from that you can't really make the standard international law argument about secession, basically saying that you know a new uh, entity, a new state, would have to enter the international community uh, through kind of the standard 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 means of or the standard procedures. You could also say that. Uh, if you look at how the European uh, Court of Justice has kind of interpreted the meaning of EU citizenship, there is something more again to what the court is, uh, is advancing on, on the notions of European citizenship rather than again the, the, the standard notion that this is, should be an, an, um, rights only conferred to um, members or citizens of member states. So again, there is one standard interpretation that EU citizenship is nothing else than certain perks and benefits that come to you if you're a citizen of a member state. But again, from the European Court of Justice, um, there seems to be something much deeper going on in, 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 in when it comes to EU citizenship. Again, we haven't tried this, so we don't really know where, where uh, the, the apples will fall in, in that kind of conflict. And again, I think another argument that can be made is that the European Commission is supposed to protect the integrity of the internal market. That is one of the key functions uh, that, that the Commission should do. And of course, excluding without you know, a due um, seven, seven and a half, half uh, million people from, from that market or, or disrupt the market as, uh, as, as would happen as a consequence of, uh, of um, uh, Catalonia leaving the EU, leaving the internal market, will also be uh, against, go, uh, at least go against the notion of, of, uh, of, uh, of the Commission as protecting the, the functioning and the perfectioning of, of the internal market. Okay, arguments mostly to perhaps uh, complicate those standard uh, notions that we usually hear when we talk about capital independence. I'm not saying that these are particularly right. I'm not saying that these are the right interpretation. I'm just putting it out there. Since this was very much uh, on the table when Scotland had its referendum. And these are actually uh, taken from, from an article by, by um, Keneally, who was uh, published in 2014 on the Scottish, uh, Scottish case. Now, I think the problem here, and coming back to, again, the, the question of rule of law and that inherent tension of liberal democracy, is that this applies if, the Catal if Catalan independence were to have been pursued through all kind of legal means. If there were no doubt that there had been a legal referendum, that there had been a kind of a, a, a due process leading to Catalan independence, I think all these uh, cases could have been, been made in order to kind of seek to, f to find a solution at, at, at kind of um, a transition phase for Catalonia to negotiate its membership while being in the EU, basically. Now, since it's so clear that we are talking about a breach of legality from, from, from the Catalan side, I think um, these, these questions or these remarks are going to be uh, 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 very hard to kind of present, at least, or claim from, from, the Catalan, from the Catalan case. And I think that has been one of the greatest mistakes from, from the Catalan side thus far, that clear break with, with legality. And I'm going to return to that as I, as I finished. But one just then quick uh, uh, reflection on, I think, what Jose Luis was also uh, mentioning, and that is, the problem that we have seen, and one I think, one of the of course elements here in the conflict between Spain and Catalonia has been <laughs> the um, uh, the conflict between uh, notions of what Spain is. Obviously, if it is a, a pluralist, multinational country or, or or something else, that is of course one big part of this element. But I think another big part of the element is the um, the poor confidence that so many uh, Spanish citizens have in, its, in their judicial system. And the uh, controversial role, as just as you mentioned, that the Constitutional Court has played in, in settling constitutional matters in Spain. So one, of course, one key here, I think, in, in moving, the, um, moving to a perhaps more constructivist, constructive uh, position is to address constitutional reform not only in terms of uh, addressing the fiscal compact and the cultural compact, uh, as we heard before, but also uh, addressing the, uh, the issue of the judiciary and the role of the constitutional court uh, in, in Spain. This is just a graph showing you the 
um, from the Eurobarometer, the uh, people that tend to trust or not in the justice system in, in their respective countries. Sweden obviously rank among the highest and Spain ranks among the, the lowest. From the same um, um, opinion poll, the, um, the question on uh, the idea that whether law is applied to everyone equal and without discrimination, you see that Spain is, is on the far, far end with a very low kind of support for, le very low for, the support for that notion that there is actually, uh, uh, you know, the law is, is equal to all, whereas, again, Sweden is, is on the other, other side. So let me then finish by saying that I think that strengthening rule of law and the kind of uh, getting at, um, again, the getting back to the idea that having constitutional court in Spain as being a, some kind of a neutral arbiter on conflicts, uh, conflicts that deal with, with uh, constitutional reform or perhaps enhancing self-rule or, or regional autonomy in Spain is key to solving this, 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 this conflict. And I think, uh, I mean, both sides has, has done uh, um, transgressions and, and, and perhaps made it, made it hard for outside uh, actors within the EU to, uh, uh, to kind of take sides or, or, or try to contribute to an, a solution here. There is the possibility, I think, from the Commission to kind of perhaps look at the judicial reforms and, and strengthen rule of law in, in, the e in, in Spain. But of course, that at the end of the day is a political, political decision. OK, thank you very much. So I had one question for you, but I don't know how quickly you're going to be able to answer. I'll um, try to be brief. And we have very, we're quite ahead of the schedule now. I'm just going to formulate it. If you can answer very, very quickly, then maybe you can answer. So what do you think it should have been the role of the European Union with respect to the conflict? Because we have seen that they haven't intervened at all. And that kind of connects back with Jose Lu what Jose Luis was saying before, that the Spanish people, they were waiting for some sort of intervention from the European Union. And basically, just as a summary, what they have been saying is that whatever the central government decides, they'll just accept it. So very quickly, do you think that that shouldn't have been the, uh, their position? They should have taken some sort of a stand on it? I think, again, I think it's extremely hard for the EU to do something uh, at this point, exactly because of the reasons that I mentioned. Since it's so clear that the Catalan government has broken with the legality of, of the Spanish uh, system, even though you can criticize the functioning of, of you know, the, the Spanish judicial system, even though we can point to the def deficits here. Since the Catalan government has made this as their strategy, as Jose Luis was saying, to create their, their own legality, it's going to be extremely hard for EU leaders and EU institutions to side with them. So to them, it is, I mean, I think, and, 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 and yes, the EU is still a club of, of sovereign states. That is one thing. Kind of they are, are, are perhaps worried about the ripple effect that it would have. But I think that, that this is actually key, that the rule of law, the principle of rule of law, cannot be easily uh, uh, discarded by, by the rest of, of the EU institutions and, and, uh, and representatives of member states. <coughs> and this, but if this was something that the Catalans did not think about or did not fully understand, I don't know. But I think this has been a crucial mistake on their ha behalf, even though I don't support perhaps what the Spanish government is doing right now. So on that note, thank you again. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. We have now Katerina, who's going to be making some more philosophical remarks on the democratic aspect of the conflict. Good. So, um, yes, I want to um, make some brief notes um, on the issue from uh, the point of view of political philosophy and uh, democratic theory. Uh, and I will speak on secessionist uh, referenda in general, basically speaking, because I'm not an expert in the uh, Catalonia case. Um, but I think there are some interesting lessons to be learned uh, from, this, um, from this case and also uh, interesting um, implications to be drawn from political philosophy for uh, the case of the uh, uh, Catal Catalonian um, secessionist uh, referendum. So um, one thing we could uh, look at from the point of view of political philosophy and moral philosophy, more generally speaking, is of course the substantive issue. Um, can secession be justified in a, in a moral sense? Um, I will not say very much about that issue, but I will get back to it in the end and address it briefly. 
Um, another question we can ask is uh, about the procedural issue, of course, and that has been uh, up on the, on the table already. Was the vote legitimate or is any such vote legitimate? Um, I'm not going to look into the kind of constitutionality of, the, uh, of these kinds of uh, referenda as, as they are proposed right now. I'm not going to talk either about the low turnout due to uh, l many different factors and what that might mean for the legit legitimacy of the outcome. Um, but I want to um, look more closely at the procedure in itself and, and whether that can be said to be a legitimate procedure to actually settle and solve this issue. And uh, so all my points hold, even if there would have been a clear majority of Catalans for secession, uh, we could still kind of ask these, qu uh, these questions from um, political philosophy. So basically we are looking at this question, who should take part and how in what decision? So that's kind of the question about the, the procedure and how, how uh, legitimate it is. So we have the who and the how and the what, and of course uh, the what is kind of given in this case, it's, uh, it's the independence referendum, so I'm not going to say uh, very much more about that. Uh, the how, basically we all take a settled that um, everybody should have an equal vote among the Catalans uh, and then uh, decide uh, by majority rule. Uh, that might be contested, but I'm not going <laughs> into that either. I'm going to be concerned with the who. So. Um, who should take part in this referendum? Who should get a vote in this referendum? So this, is, uh, this is problem is known as the boundary problem in uh, political philosophy. And it's, um, it's taken to be, uh, um, it has been taken to be quite a, quite a, a serious problem. Um, and I will say a little bit more about that. But so the, the who, of course, is also what is kind of um, notoriously contested, especially when it comes to uh, secession movements and secession referenda, who should actually take part in these referenda when it's just about splitting up uh, a greater group. And um, of course uh, we could make kind of um, appeal to conventions, to kind of given groups that we're already dealing with. So we have the group of, you know, the Catalans, I don't know, residents in uh, Catalonia or Catalans in some other respect. Uh, but then, of course, there's some contestation, well, why should only the Catalans have a vote on this decision? Why not all the Spanish citizens? And um, appeal to convention, appeal to given collectives will always face this problem that we will ask why, why this collective rather than that? And uh, so we need a principled answer in order to settle this question. And this is something that political theory can help us with. I mean, another question would be, uh, so why not all EU citizens, for instance? Or, you know, you can expand the demos even further. So who should make the decision? We need a principled answer. So within democratic theory, there has been, um, there, there has been the, um, the idea that this boundary problem is actually a very big challenge to democratic theory itself. And uh, so the idea has been, and sometimes people still refer to it uh, today, as um, who should take part here? That's a question that can't be solved by democratic theory. And by that, it seems that many people think this means that uh, this question can't be, solve, can't be solved democratically. But this is, of course, uh, a mistake. That's a kind of mistaken way of framing uh, this uh, issue, the boundary problem. Because how to understand democracy and how to design a democratic system isn't itself a question for democratic decision making. It has implications for how we can make democratic decisions, but it needn't and shouldn't, I would say, uh, be settled by <laughs> democratic decision making. So there is no kind of regress on we have to let somebody vote on who should be able to vote on this decision and so on and so forth. That's, that's <coughs> just a misconception. Um, rather, when we, when we wonder um, how, to, um, how to answer this question, we should turn to the values that we take democracy to um, realize or to instantiate. So what are the values we are um, trying to achieve or, um, or uh, aim for when making these democratic decisions? I will give you two um, suggested answers to the boundary problem question, uh, which are quite pertinent in the um, political philosophy literature. And I will try to briefly connect them to these values that I now mentioned. So 
One suggestion is what has been known now as the all subjected principle. Basically framed for this kind of referendum issue, we could say that um, it says that all and only those who are subject to rule should have influence in a decision over it. So all those who are, who are subject to a law should be able to influence the, the decision about the law. Uh, the rival account here is the uh, all affected principle and it says that all and only those whose relevant interests are significant, significantly affected by a decision should have influence over it. So let's um, look briefly at the all subjective principle then uh, to see what it might say uh, in this uh, regard and also I'm kind of losing this thing here uh, and also what kind of values we might think it, it uh, realizes or instantiates. So um, this referendum, I'm not, I'm not very familiar with kind of the all the legal framework, but we could say that this referendum basically is about a constitutional issue. It's about a constitutional issue for the whole of Spain, the Spanish constitution. And then we would have to say that all who are subjected to, um, to this um, uh, constitution uh, should then get a vote um, in, the, in the referendum. And uh, this, of course, uh, would mean that all Spanish citizens, basically, uh, should have a, a vote in this, in this referendum. Of course, we might also say then that it's not only a vote about the Spanish constitution, it's also a vote about creating a new constitution, a Catalan constitution. And that constitution will affect or will subject uh, Catalans. So in a way, Catalans are more subjected here, or their subjection, there's more at stake in terms of subjection for, for the Catalans. So does that mean they should get more influence in the decisions? Or it's, I think, even for the all subjective principle, these secession, uh, secessionist referenda are a bit of a problem. Mostly we take um, the, uh, um, the correct um, decision rule in this case to be uh, the uh, one person, one vote majority rule. And we do that because we think that this, in a very important sense, uh, gives us equality. It treats people equally. Everybody gets a vote. Moreover, on the uh, all subjective principle, another value that's very prominent is autonomy, uh, obviously. And autonomy in the sense of um, taking part in making the laws for oneself. So very clearly a sense of autonomy at uh, stake here. It's about the right to decide the right to decide for oneself. Of course, the uh, overall problem with the all subjective principle is that it seems to misfire in some cases where people might be uh, not subjected to laws, but heavily affected by their out outcomes. So um, when uh, a law, for instance, regulates uh, the pollution of a factory um, within a country, um, then this factory, the factory owner and others are subjected to this law but people living in the neighboring country getting all the pollution <laughs> onto their lot, uh, they are not subjected by the law, or they're heavily affected. And then it seems a bit strange to say that only the subjected people sh should get a say in how to make the laws Thanks. Um, um, for, for, for instance, um, pollution and, and how, how, to, how to not to pollute and so on and so forth. Um, so basically what we can say that is that the all subjective principle, it can take equality and autonomy into account, but doesn't really take welfare into account. And welfare is another value um, that, we, that we really care about. And this is of course where the all affected principle has its strength, one might uh, suppose. Uh, because it takes into account the affected interests of people. We could say that it actually takes welfare into due consideration. Uh, moreover, it also gives people a say over things that concern them, so it's also kind of appealing to autonomy and equality when we have the kind of equal vote. So we have everything in one neat package, it might seem. But, and this is my final point, I want to um, draw your attention to a problem with the all affected principle and in, uh, um, in that respect also to all these secessionist movements. Uh, because they are, in a way, too myopic, too short-sighted when it comes to welfare. Because they consider the welfare, the affected interests of the people 
in the uh, in the area in in for instance in Catalonia. Um, the problem is that when we let these people decide autonom autonomously um, and presumably in accordance with their affected interests, then collective dilemmas of a more large scale um, dimension become much harder to solve. So this is basically a brief point about the substantive issue. Apart from how all these um, decisions affect um, the Catalans and the Spanish citizens and maybe the EU citizens, there's also this kind of global perspective, of course, on the issue. And I think that this is a real uh, challenge for all these secession secessionist movements. Um, because when we face these global problems, um, when we face uh, these uh, problems that have been described as a tragedy of the commons, where irrespective what of what all the others do, um, it's better for me to pollute the environment, for instance, because, I mean, my small contribution doesn't really make a difference anyway. And if everybody reasons in this way, of course, then we get a uh, lot of pollution, global warming, and so on and so forth. Everybody's worse off by doing what's better for them. So that's kind of the, the uh, basic problem. Not all problems, of course, are tragedy of the common problems. But the most important problems of today are these kinds of problems. It's global warming, it's global poverty, it's um, yeah, th all these problems where we actually have to collaborate. And so this is my kind of final point that there is, a, there is an added danger, I think, to these secessionist movements of kind of creating even more of these kind of independent actors who see to their own interests in a global kind of environment where we actually need to break through these kind of separate interest uh, thinking and you know think think globally and of course this doesn't mean that everything would be much better if uh, the Catalans remained in Spain <laughs> uh, because Spain is just another actor on the uh, on the kind of global scheme uh, uh, facing these kind of um, collective dilemmas um, but it's kind of a caution um, kind of cautious remark as to this kind of the direction of this movement of going yeah. local and uh, yeah, improving autonomy on uh, the kind of uh, cost of um, global welfare. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So Thank that's you. my.